right? And, and, but they all came, they all worshiped. And when Jesus addressed them, he didn't say, we're going to wait here until you all believe. In fact, he didn't did he use the word believe. Is that in there? He didn't say, he didn't address that. Instead, he sent them to do the work regardless of where they, of where they were. The Lord approves. Yeah. Or doesn't. I think I just got cut off. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like regard regardless regardless of that like they were they were all commissioned equally i don't know what that means yes i'm also struck by um the verbs that are there for these disciples and and t touching on what you said, it doesn't say anything about believing. It's just like, you know, they're like, it's like, go make disciples, baptize and teach. Those are the things that you have control over. <laughs> you don't have control over the other things. I'm in charge of the other stuff. This is the things that you are in charge of. Mm -hmm. um, and I will be with you in that, which I just find interesting. Mm -hmm. So are you saying you can still doubt and believe? Uh, yeah, I think so. Or at the very least, you can you, you can doubt and be faithful. Or, or maybe I should say you can still doubt and be okay. And I know we've all heard this before, but doubt and faith are not opposites. Yeah. Um, certainty is the opposite of faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, I mean, there's there's space in this text to doubt, uh, and it, it's striking to me that Jesus doesn't chastise the eleven. He doesn't give them the "O oh, ye of little faith." I mean, this is the first time they're seeing him in his resurrected form. They've only heard from the ladies, the women evangelists, that he's risen to go to Galilee. So this is their first time to see him. According to that. According, right, in, in this in narrative. This um, and they're, spe yeah, they, they don't get chastised for, uh, for wondering if their eyes are betraying them or if what they're, who they're, if this is true or real. Um, and it, and if, if there's space in this story in the presence of the resurrected Christ, to doubt. How much more, you know, to to <laughs> to pull from Paul, you know, how much more should there be space? Uh, and I think there's something too about like the the relationship of those verbs to go and make and teach, um, in light of the presence of doubt in all of them. Like that has to affect the spaces that are held to go and make and teach. Like if there's room in this space for doubt, shouldn't there be room in these spaces out among the nations? All the, all the more. It challenges yeah. the assumptions about what making disciples and teaching people means then, right? Because you can't very well say, you have to believe this. Do you believe it? No. <laughs> but I'm teaching you, so you do. Yeah. Right. So, so what can this out? <laughs> Ask me tomorrow. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can't go ahead, sir. Well, I was just I was just struck by this, like thinking about this as a as a non uh, as a non-literate context in a lot of ways of like so. Uh, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So they don't have like a book. They, you know, they, like this wasn't written down for a couple decades after. You know, so it's like, so what are, what are the things that they're, when they hear teach, teach, uh, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, what are, what are the takeaways that they, that they internalize in that? Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been helpful if Matthew would have written that down. <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, but, I think we see it earlier in Matthew. At least we get, at least we see glimpses of it when Jesus sends out the seventy. Yeah. What does it look like? He sends them out to be guests, mm -hmm. to receive hospitality, yeah. to pray for people, to see healing, and to to talk to connect the dots for people that this power comes from God. Um, I I wonder if it's just more of the same. Yeah. Of the things that they were trained. To do, and I think you're exactly right that it's not. This is not like a a lecture series. There, this is a way of life that yeah. they're that they're living out among people, um, and it's not. Yeah, it, it it's in vulnerability and humility. Mm -hmm. It's it's receiving welcome into pe people's homes, doing the things they'd already learned to do while Jesus was in his ministry in Galilee. Yeah. And I, one of the, one of the stories that sticks out to me from uh, one of the parables that stuck out, sticks out from, to me from, from Matthew is the, the wheat and the tares and, um, and the, so it's like, you know, they plant the seed and the weeds, the weeds and uh, the tares grow up within among the weeds. And the, the people ask, um, should we go out and take out the, take out those tares? And they say, no, he says, no, that it will affect, you know, that will make, make it'll kill the wheat. So wait until the end. And, and so, and then the kind of explanation of that parable, it's like that the angels are the ones in charge of doing that separating, mm -hmm. but that's not our job. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not what we're called to. We're called to, to go and to teach and, uh, and to, and make disciples and, and live in community and, and to do those things. But, but God's the one that's in charge of deciding who's in and out, who's out. Mm -hmm. That's not our, that's not our job. Yeah. Can I, can I problematize this story in for a second? Um, I, I want you all, I, I want to invite you all to re respond to this problematization of the story. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to uh -huh. problematize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only I'm only using words I've heard other people use most of the time. Uh, Sometimes it's people in tunnels. <laughs> I've heard myself say this word. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, we're not accepting that this is the world's word. <laughs> I I first heard uh, Sun, Dr. Sung Chan Ra use the verb problematize about the incarnation as a as a imagination for mission. And he was like, I want to problematize that, especially for white people. Um, don't tether yourselves too closely to the identity of Jesus when you're moving into a neighborhood, mm -hmm. like to think you're the savior or whatever, right? Yeah. So that that was the, and honestly, that's not unrelated from my problematizing of this story, which is the massive backdrop historically for this story. It is the premier text of missions and colonial enterprise, the doctrine of discovery, this massive doctrine that emerges in the Catholic church, where essentially, I mean, and it comes out of texts like this, that says the goal of the church is the evangelization of the world. And the, um, the Roman empire, um, the, the popes of the Roman Catholic church, they, they collaborate and they take texts like these and imaginations like these to develop this doctrine that says basically the European uh, explorers under the guise of the Christian banner have uh, not only permission, but blessing and sanction from God to go throughout all of the world and using whatever means necessary, uh, evangelize, Christianize, the the baptize yeah uh the planet willie jennings book the christian imagination is stunning and uh heartbreaking in the way that he describes oh henry one of the henrys in portugal and the way he is he is by the pope by pope nicholas this is like 15th century he is sanctioned as an agent of god in the first slave slave trade in historical record and that that the slave trade of 200 or so black bodies is spiritualized as an act of worship uh before god uh and 
and um, Hen Prince Henry uh, offers a tithe to God of black bodies because that is part of the, the spiritual imagination. He's doing God's will to do this because the, the, the overarchy, uh, overarching uh, end goal in game is the evangelization of all peoples of the world, parentheses, by whatever means necessary. And so, so perpetual slavery, enslavement, was a part of the imagination of how that came to be, um, which is a horrendous application of this story and highly problematic and, and, and something that has continued in that, that DNA. And like one frame for it is maybe just the DNA of assimilation that, that the, the job of the church is to assimilate the world into it, to, to erase differences, to erase culture, and to, um, to get people to buy in. We could call it to belief. We could even call it to our, you know, to our, we could dress it up and say, you know, we're inviting people into our way of life, but it, it's this assimilative logic where, where we're trying to take over the world, and we're doing so because that's what Jesus tells us to do. Now, how do you read this story in a way that is not that? Because if we can't, we have to throw it in the garbage. I just out of like human decency, right? Um, yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. Well, in some of the missiologists, po post-colonial missiologists, Laman Santa is one of them. He's African, I think. Uh, he, uh, he would say, well, instead of like assimilation, we should use the language of translation instead. Like the gospel needs to be translated into various cultures and contexts, which even then like is problematic because who's doing the translating? Who gets to decide how it gets translated? Who's the sender? And who is the receiver? On some level, even below the surface, it just continues um, the, the understanding that it's us and them, that we're, we're bringing something to you. We have the truth. We'll, we'll decide how it gets translated into your con context, which it, it just seems like uh, that colonial impulse dressed up in a, in a new way. So... Let me let me see if I can tie this thread back to our other the one. doubting. Yeah, yes. a little bit. Okay. Because so and and like actually let me go back because Sarah, you pointed out the verbs in the sentence, but I want to I want to nitpick that because the verbs, the actual verbs, um, and I think I'm gonna get the terms right, or were were go and make. And baptizing and teaching are gerunds, right? Herundios. Right. They are right. They they are it is a form of a verb that's really an adjective. It's it's a descriptive word that's that's like as you're going and making, and in in implicit in that statement is you're probably going to be doing your 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 template for making disciples based on the context that you're in. Go look at you know the Essenes, go look at some of these others. You're, there's a lot of baptizing. There's a lot of teaching. So when you're doing that, do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the new part, right? When you're teaching, again, we're not teaching, you have to think this way, you have to believe this way. You're teaching the things I commanded you, right? That way of life that you talked about. Hmm. And so I, this is now I'm going to jump to wonder. I wonder how much of that baptizing and teaching is just that cultural context because you know i've memorized this passage uh and that and and the, if you you know the central word in it was supposed to be baptize as a church of christ kid <laughs> see <laughs> jesus said you have to baptize um notice you looked at a, a baptist as you said that right <laughs> fair enough 
Um, but y'all didn't do it right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right, right. But like un, un, unpacking all of that and going, okay, that. So where was I? I was so so. I wonder how much of that is this context, and and how much of the focus is really. I've shown you a new way to live. Like I was thinking about, like what are the things that Jesus actually commanded to the disciples? Like mm -hmm. the first thing that came to my mind was, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them. Mm. Um, or like, why are you arguing among yourselves about who, which one of you is greater? Um, like he he didn't do a lot of religiousy commands. Mm -hmm. He pushed back against a lot of establishment. Right. Yeah. It was this. It was this. How do you how do you treat other people? Mm -hmm. How do you value other people? How do you interact with and take care of, right? And I do think that there is a way to go into every context and teach that, right? We can, we can look at other cultures and have respect for other cultures, but also see things that they're doing that are problematic and that are not helpful, right? And instead of coming in and saying, well, we have to baptize you this way, and then you have to, marriage has to look like this, and church has to look like this, and business has to look like this, and we're going to build a town like that. I've, I've, been, I've been reading a uh, history of Texas, and right, and that's a big part of it, is that the, the Francescans come in and plant these missions and mm -hmm. enslave people, but they say that they're evangelizing to them, mm -hmm. right? Um, right. Like take all the religious stuff out of that and just be like, hey, go teach people how to treat each other and how to value each other, how to love each other. Hmm. And that that call is to something higher than the law. Yeah. Like I'm thinking about specifically in Matthew so much of that, like the Sermon on the Mount, um, you know, like the, the law says this, but I'm calling you to something even greater, uh, even more of a commitment uh, that that you can't achieve, because, but I'm with you kind of mm -hmm. that presence as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't want to get that way down into the weeds on that, but I do think, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, really, I really do, but this is not the time. I mean, I do, but I know <laughs> limits. This is the limits. Okay, yeah, you're right. Okay, okay. Guilty. Um, <laughs> but, but since Sarah brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> Blame it on Sarah. Yeah, blame it on Sarah. Hey, I'll throw you off the bus here. Uh, no, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount is, you know, when you get to that point, we always took a look at teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you as, as the way that this keeps on getting reproduced, uh, you know, Matthew 28. Well, this is part of teaching them to observe all things. It's going out in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you have to take that in the context of Matthew too. And uh, what, you know, there's five teaching sections in Matthew. So what did he teach them in Matthew? What is he saying and what do you teach him in Matthew? Um, and you cannot avoid what is in the Sermon on the Mount, which I always find it very interesting, incongruent. I won't say ironic because you have to intend that. Uh, but incongruent is that everyone's debating about putting the Ten Commandments in Texas schools, but no one's talking about putting the Beatitudes in Texas schools, you know? Uh, you know, we're going to fight over... Socialists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to fight over one, but we wouldn't <laughs> even think about it. No one even talks about that. Uh, but yet that's really what Matthew is talking about, mm -hmm. at least I think, from what, from what I'm reading on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just... I, I do think there is a case for going. Um, and I have read... A kickback on that particular thing that the gerunds actually do have the force of imperative too in the great i don't know i'm i don't know you know yeah i don't know i'm just not sure uh yeah you know, just irritates me that people actually come back when i thought i had a really good grasp on it and they suggest something else uh -huh. what do you mean <laughs> you know just got that one uh but at the same time there is an imperative there that we are somehow supposed to announce the good news that this has to be good news some form or some way that god is king mm -hmm. but what does that look like mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we've carried it way too far on what god is king looks like because we've decided what you know that what has, that has to look like culturally mm -hmm. um but i do think 
you know, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, if you're going to take it, you got to take it in the context of Matthew. Sure. I think you have to take it too in the context of, I mean, in Matthew is this conversation about like this, this text has been dubbed the Great Commission. Um, but there's, uh, there's, there, I think there's only one place in Matthew where, well, there is the greatest, who's the greatest conversation, but in terms of like the greatest teachings, the, the only, the place in Matthew where that comes up in, in the language of the conversation is the greatest commands. What are the, what, if you're to sum up the law, what, what, what's, what's greatest in the law, loving God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself. And, um, I, I think that's a that's a filter through which to read and view and interpret this commissioning text that if it doesn't look like loving God and loving our neighbors, we have violated the intent of this commission. Yes, that's right. That's the logic of Matthew five through seven. That's right. Yep. Was there a. We have a Ryan over here. Uh, yeah. So um, the whole colonialization thing, uh -huh. like that makes me feel so much better about my baggage. Um, <laughs> so so uh, because so that, is this sarcasm or uh, no, okay, no okay, actually. Okay. So when uh, in the work Sir and I used to do, um, we were part of this organization at the time that was like there, there was this talk of like, okay, well, like once we engage every people group on the planet, then like game over, right? Yeah. And so that was part of the, um, so that was what I had hangups on before. And so I feel way better about that mm. now. Um, but so anyhow, that's kind mm. of some of my baggage that I bring to this mm -hmm. passage is like, how do I think about that? Um, and then I guess what you were saying about translation, um, it's like just, it's just really tricky. Um, this, like what we're talking about reminds me of this story where we had a woman colleague within a Baptist organization, and that's already like pretty edgy, right? That this, this woman, you know, that this woman is like actually like leading a not insignificant group of people within our organization. And she was really cool, by the way. Um, and she was working in uh, like kind of an Arabic Islamic kind of setting. And there were some ladies that uh, decided to follow Jesus. And uh, there was like this dilemma, right? Because these ladies decide that they should be baptized. Um, and our my friend, this colleague, this woman leader is like, I'm not allowed to baptize them because I'm a woman within my denomination, within this organization. So what do I do? Um, and it was just really tricky, right? Because she has like this kind of like organizational kind of bureaucracy kind of hierarchy and, and belief structure that's dictating what she's allowed to do. Um, and then she has these people that want to believe and like, and it's tricky too, because where are they going to find a man to do this? Like in an Arabic Islamic situation, mm -hmm. there could actually like be some danger involved mm -hmm. um, for any of them. And um, so I just remember her like wrestling with this and like, as long I'll wind it up because I don't have an answer. Like it's just an example to me of like how tricky this is. Um, like, in the, you know, where my brain goes is like, how did these women get the idea that baptism was important? Did they just get that from reading the gospels or reading the new Testament on, um, or did my colleague somehow like convey that because of her own kind of set of beliefs and biases? Like, you know, that's what I end up wondering, uh, how that story played out, uh, was that actually the next time she saw them one of the women had baptized the other and they sorted out themselves. And so that was like really cool. <laughs> that was really cool. Um, you know, and so it like problem solved in a sense. And I think that it was just an example of the Holy spirit, probably uh, sorting things out. But yeah. yeah. Love that. I have a couple thoughts, neither of which are definitive or 
grossly helpful to any of this, but um, that's too bad because that all of my thoughts are definitive and grossly helpful. helpful. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I just finished reading this book called Everything Sad is Untrue, which had a lot of hype and it wasn't as good as I hoped. So take that for what it's worth. But it is a story of a refugee from Iran who came because his family, he was Muslim and they were, um, I'm not going to say it right, but the word is S-A-Y-Y-E-D, which means you believe that you are, you can prove that you are somehow descended from Mohammed. And um, so it makes you like not royalty, but like pretty hardcore Muslim. Like when you tell people you are, I, I said it when I was reading it, Saeed, but I don't know if that's right. Yes, it's like I could, yes, okay, like I can trace myself back. And so people are like, oh, like you're really special. Um, so his mom, some Christian missionary somehow got in the country and his mom, who was a surgeon, they worked really hard at converting her and baptized her. And then long story short, they had to leave the country under duress because people who had been converted were, you know, being beheaded in the street and left his family and now came and he has spent the rest of his growing up life with his mom as a janitor at a hospital and like just the juxtaposition of she was a neurosurgeon in Iran and her degrees don't mean anything here and just the long process of being allowed to enter this country where he had perceived this religion had been so welcoming and like you just have to become a Christian and like the pro like what that cost them and then what the welcome was on the other end is so jarring um it just really leaves you feeling so uneasy about the whole the whole, um, you know, foreign missionary goals and concepts of, of passages like this. Um, and then in your mind, I think I go back to this default of I was taught, well, like Jesus says, you'll suffer for him, you know, and that you'll, it will come at a cost. And you're like, but really like, this was a kid who like, his dad couldn't get out of the country. So his mom is raising him and they send them to Edmond, Oklahoma. And he's like, just imagine going from, he had, they had lived on all this property with fountains. And he says, he, it's, it is really beautiful in some points. It just was kind of a boring book. But um, he says, you know, like Americans spend their money on things and people in Iran spend their money on space. And so like, they have all these fountains and goats and date and big tree, you know, all this stuff. <clears throat> and then going from all that to Oklahoma City, um, where he he's now an adult obviously a writer so that that kind of thing I sit with all the how many stories there must be like that that are so unsettling um for me and how to reconcile what this means so then I'm thinking we watched Indiana Jones last night um with Chloe as there's a new one coming out we we're like you should watch these old ones and first one he's looking for the Ark of the Covenant you know and they get to the end where now you're gonna um, spoil it huh yeah. This is the first one. I've years. That, that, that with me, yeah, like I felt like the I statue had, of limitations expired. Right? I've seen spoiling. it since I was a kid, so I was <laughs> right. Um. Yep. So, um, I'm why you're watching this and you're thinking like so. In the, everybody, Indiana Jones and the Nazis are trying to find the lost Ark of the Covenant, and Indiana Jones' purpose is so that he can study it and know it more and like what good could we use for either archeological historical future purposes. And the Nazis are so that if we have the power of God, we can take over the world if it's going before us. Um, and I'm thinking, I would just was sitting with that thinking about this book I had just finished. Like, I think the problem is not that Jesus asked us to do this, but that there's such grossly different motivations mm. and way and um, the ramifications are not weighed out because this this book is like, man, there's a cost, but it didn't come to the people who were, you know, evangelizing. The cost came to the other people. And so it's very easy to tell somebody, I think, um, well, there's a cost for following Jesus when it's not your cost. Um, so just, just, I'm just sitting with the discomfort of that. And I don't know what vision of healing or liberation can come from that but you think about indiana jones you're like man he just wanted the ark of the covenant to protect it from evil and to see what like historical value it had and not world domination 
And I just feel like evangelical Christianity has aired on the side of world domination mm-hmm. and not like, how can we protect the story of God in its purity? It's really good. Uh, I, I will say a thing and then we'll, for the sake of time, we'll do our last reading. Um, that connects to what I was, uh, that connects to what I was thinking about. I mean, I think in this text, part of what gets distorted and corrupted is when there is a, um, like a, a narrative of supremacy that's at play or that latches on to the imagination of this text. And, you know, we're familiar with white supremacy. I think Christian supremacy is a thing too, um, that Christians are superior uh, and that non-Christians are inferior. And um, and that Christian supremacy, I think, is what animates the doctrine of discovery. Um, in, anytime uh, we create narratives where we're up here and folks are down here, this power differential that's created creates the conditions for harm, for abuse, for oppression, for subjugation, for the de- dehumanization of this other group and the things that happened there. And so I think part of how we respond to this text in healthy ways is dismantling those notions of supremacy. Well, I mean, isn't Christianity wonderful, Charles? But well, yeah, yes, I think it is. I, I follow it because I think it is. But I, I, Christian supremacy is something different than that. I think the language of our, of our tradition is humility. Uh, the way of Jesus is kenosis or self-emptying, self-giving. That is, that's the vibe, not not supremacy. So we have to dismantle. And I think we have resources in the gospels too, where, where we, we don't enter into new contexts to make disciples, to find all the problems and to fix the problems. There are problems. We will find them. We can talk about them, but we also go expecting to find the imprint of the creator in that context. We expect to find Samaritans, who are outside of our tribe caring for folks and doing justice in ways that poke at our preconceptions and our our assumptions about what the other is like, right? We have all of Jesus does that all throughout the gospels. Um anyway, the I mean this I this is a really important conversation. I may I, I think I um care about it a lot just by virtue of my vocation. Um, But I think to the degree that we're all Christian folks trying to figure out how do we, what does it mean for us to be spiritual communities in our neighborhood? uh, Some of the deconstructing we have to do is around stories like this and not to throw them in the trash, but to say, no, that's actually a terrible way of understanding what that really should be or what it is. Um, Yeah. Yes. And some doubted, and there was space for that, and they weren't annihilated. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Could we get somebody to do the last reading around Be Still? What's the text calling you to pay attention to in yourself to more fully support this resistance and vision? And for the sake of time, this will be, we'll just do a, introspective kind of reflection and we'll we'll end with our minute of silence to reflect on what this might mean for each of us now the 11 disciples went to galilee to the mountain to which jesus sent them and when they saw them they bowed down worshiping him but some doubted Then Jesus came and said to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now look, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is the text calling you to pay attention to in yourself to more fully support this resistance and vision?
Thank you, God, for your presence here with us. Thank you, Jesus, for space to doubt and to wrestle. Uh, thank you for your example of self-giving love, for your invitation and modeling of a, a way of life that loves God and loves our neighbors. Would you give us the strength of your spirit to love each other well, to love our neighbors well, and for that to, um, to be a witness, to be a testimony of your work in this world, of your, uh, your reign, your gracious and loving reign, and uh, the renewal and restoration that you are working in this cosmos and in humanity. In Jesus' name, amen.